I mean, I don't even have to say that, but Kubernetes, as everybody knows, is one of the most amazing technologies similar to the Linux kernel, which has transformed how we build and run modern infrastructure. But let's be honest, it's still notoriously complex to operate. Most engineers spend more time deciphering YAML and hunting down logs than actually delivering value. And that is the challenge that is becoming to let developers, engineers do what they do the best to create value for their organizations. And that's where Lens Prism comes in. It is the first embedded AI assistant for Kubernetes built directly into the Lens ID platform. It is designed to streamline operations, surface insights, and support real-time decision-making. Joining me today is Kyle Wheeler, General Manager of Lens at Mirantis, to talk about why they built Prism, what it can do for platform and DevOps teams, and how it fits into the broader evolution of AI-powered infrastructure that Mirantis is helping build. Kyle, it's great to have you on the show. Hey, great to be here. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. We have been covering Lens since it was acquired. Uh, Mirantis from the early days, but it has evolved over time. And today we are going to talk about Lens Prism. Uh, let's start with the with the core of it. Uh, our audience, they do know about Lens. If you want, you can just do a quick intro of Lens also, but I'm going to also focus more on what exactly is Lens Prism, what does it do, and how does it help Kubernetes users who are dealing with a lot of complexity? As you may know, uh, Lens is uh, one of the most popular, if not the most popular, uh, IDE for Kubernetes uh, and cloud native development. Um, with that, we provide um, essentially contextual awareness um, uh, to your clusters, uh, vis visibility to um, logs, reporting, uh, et cetera, in a very uh, user friendly uh, and beautiful UI. Uh, so, taking you from essentially command line and terminal uh, into something that's graphically easy to understand. Uh, again, reducing the complexity, uh, especially when dealing with complex infrastructure. Can you also talk about um, AI? I mean, at KubeCon also, and before that also, Mirantes and folks are doing a lot of work in the AI space. Uh, um, talk a bit about what the reason for embedding AI system, you know, in something like lens um how what specific problem you're trying to solve in terms of of course reducing complexity in the cloud data environment but in general how it's further complement what lens id already does right so so just quickly what what lens prism is is our as you said our uh essentially ai assistant inside of lens uh and as in following with kind of Lens value proposition and really vision uh, of reducing complexity, um, we looked at solutions and ways to um, really fight through the noise and give actionable data and insights to developers. And so when we looked at um, different ways of implementing AI solutions, we found that um, putting this putting this uh, at the fingertips of developers um, takes it beyond uh, just entering commands to make fixes, but gives you actionable insights uh, and has, lets you have essentially conversations with this AI agent um, or AI uh, assistant. In this case, um, so what we found is that um, our kind of sweet spot with developers is going to be uh, new developers to the Kubernetes space um, that you know maybe are, don't know all the commands that they can run, um, don't know you know really how to fix the problems. And so, if you have an embedded AI assistant uh, inside of Lens, you really get surfaced information a lot faster, um, and then you get some insights and action items of where should I go to fix this or how to fix this, and even commands to tell you what to fix. Right. And also, when we talk about AI assistant, of course, we are not talking about, you know, agent to agent or agent to care. We are talking about developers interacting. Now, the thing is with the, with the LLMs or AI, Gen AI is the prompts. They are the key. It's more like if you don't ask the right question, you won't get the right answer. So how do you also enable them because they need to know the right prompts or it's just like how it becomes easy for for their workflow as well? Or do they need to know specific things to ask? 
Right. So, so our strategy has been to uh, to essentially have a, a middle layer of pre prompting that we do ourselves to give that context to um, to the LLM, whatever that LLM is, whether that's OpenAI, uh, Azure. Uh, right now, those are the two main supported ones, or uh, any local LLM that follows kind of the OpenAI uh, is an OpenAI compatible uh, LLM. And um, so we've tried to take the guesswork out of that as much as we can. Um, but also we've given it access to essentially everything that you see in Lens. So uh, it has an awareness of context aware. Uh, so when you're in a cluster, it understands that you're talking about this cluster, this namespace or this pod. Um, and so we've given some insights as, as far as on the back end and pre-prompting, but we've also um, given some examples of what can be asked. Um, we expect this to evolve over time, um, but it's as simple as, you know, the, the same question that a developer asks right now, um, you know, what's wrong with my pods or what's wrong with this cluster? You can start there as a starting point and then start to see the information come through. So um, again, taking you from commands to conversations, um, everyone, you know, if you have leadership asking you, hey, what's wrong with this piece of, you know, <laughs> infrastructure, you can ask that question. You can ask that same question, right? Uh, we all know that uh, Kubernetes is as powerful as it is. It's also very complicated. That's why we are having this discussion and it's hard to manage. Uh, how far does Lens Prism go to reduce that operational friction without kind of hiding too much, without becoming too opinionated, without taking too much control and uh, flexibility that they would want from uh, Kubernetes? So guardrails have always been really important to us at Lens. Uh, the you know that starts with kind of our our principles of following our back um, these role based access controls uh, and giving only you know users only permission to see um, you know or inside of Lens what they already have permission in you know outside of that. So through there um, right you know and initially that's cube config files and the tokens required to have access to that. Um, so in the same way, Lens only sees, or Lens Prism only sees what you as an individual developer have access to. Um, and uh, while it, it could be more, more powerful in the future, um, we've actually limited capabilities to only give access for from a read perspective. So it's understanding its information. It's not running wild and running rampant. It sees what's happening with your clusters and then just gives the developer insight. So again, giving more control back to the developer to go and fix fix anything that's wrong. And so um, while it might surface surface a command for you, it's not going to run that command uh, for you. You would have to go and, you know, just it's as simple as clicking copy or clip, clicking a copy button uh, and then going and pasting that into a terminal session. And then, and, but it's again, at the user's uh, desire and control, right? That, that's very important to understand that AI is not in the driving seat. You are still an operator, you know, it's just a tool. And I always get the analogy of tool, you know. It's, it's, now, that, uh, thank you for so much. And uh, when I'm listening to you, also, you talk about, you know, there are some pre prompts already. But how does this AI assistant learn over time? Is it like whatever you ship it with, that's the only knowledge it has? Or it's also context aware so as also everybody's environment is also different they don't run the same kind of environment so as the the teams use it more within a specific cluster it it learns from that and it kind of gets more fine-tuned and optimized for that specific uh, organization or it's just like no it's just flat same for everybody well, so I, th I think it kind of starts wherever the LLM is, right? Um, but then what we, what it has access to in terms of you know locally on the you know the desktop application, uh, it, it has some contextual awareness. Um, we go a little bit further than that uh, by also having the ability for indiv individuals and companies that adopt uh, to go in and put in specific r rules or requirements for um, the AI. So uh, that's as simple as you know if you want it to, uh, for example, if you want to say, hey, speak only to me in German. Uh, for example, it can, you know, it can do that. Um, but then if there's other things, more technical related items uh, that you want to pre prompt it with, you can do that as well as an individual user. So it's not just, um, you know, and that, that can be at the organizational level. So if your company has some, you know, some things that they want to kind of codify of, hey, this is how we, how we do things, um, then, you know, that's, that's what the, uh, what Lens Prism would abide by, right? In the future, so what we um, what we're looking at now is so because the, you know most of our users come to Lens um, not just for um, you know creating another terminal session, they come to Lens for visibility and seeing uh, these kind of beautiful reports and and so forth. Um, and and navigating through kind of the different information pieces inside of Lens or that you would want to see in your clusters. Um, so in the future, what we're looking at is. Um, 
essentially hard coded uh, links. So as um, as Lens Prism surfaces information, it would also have a you know a link to that specific log, for example, and you can go and see that in the context inside of Lens, uh, or you know go into a specific dashboard or what have you within Lens. Uh, so connecting again the agent or the not the agent but the assistant with the uh, the UI, which also makes me wonder that uh, how do you see it evolve beyond you know what you have started because when we look at cloud when you look at kubernetes we talk about cost optimization we talk about policy information of course geopolitical things are changing so we have to focus also there are a lot of heavily regulated industries uh, then you're talking observability you're looking at uh, problem happen some kind of predictive diagnostics so how do you see lens uh, prism evolve beyond what you have started just right now so, so what's interesting about kind of the, the, what we see in the future is that, um, is we can already do some of this today. Uh, but because of kind of our understanding, I mean, even our in internal cloud developers that have have been using Lens Prism for some time, um, you know, we, we said, okay, there's a resistance to, like you said, uh, letting AI run wild. And uh, so we put in very specific guardrails um, on the front end, but We've in in kind of some demo environments removed some of the guardrails of okay you can go and run the command so not just running a command for read access but to go and actually change uh, change things on the cluster uh, implement code that yourself um, so I, what that looks like and how you know what the adoption of that looks like uh, obviously you know if I'm in the driver's seat I want to be in the driver's seat I don't want someone going and doing the work for me um, you know we like control right um, and so we're, we're trying to trying to fight those two ends of hey this could make your life a little bit easier but at the same time there's some some risk involved and so right now our stance is you know we're just going to surface the information and you can take and do with that what you want you can review the commands before they're run um, but in the future that might look as some you know something like um, you know, I, hey, set up a daily report and just tell me what's going on with my clusters and also go ahead and fix those things that are wrong with them, <laughs> you know? Uh, so it could, could get pretty, pretty, um, uh, exciting i think pretty fast uh, but again we've got to balance that with you know company policies uh individual users resistance to kind of again letting ai run wild uh and so with everything that we do um we started with kind of this control plane of hey yeah this is these are the this is the the box that ai can live in inside of my environment uh and that can be on an individual developer standpoint of you know we can just not have it you know do any any writing commands and only read, um, or we can set that as an open, you know, open it up a little bit more. So, but that would be up to the user, right? Every time we talk about AI these days, uh, I was also talking to someone at the Open Source Summit, and they're like, "It's the first time where tech people are getting scared about things because we have been like taking other people's job in a way, or like a tech is only, but now because of Chat GPT and Gen AI." our own jobs, you know, he was mentioning uh, is at risk. The first time we are tasting our own medicine. Um, when we look at Gen AI embedding in Lens Prism, is it enabling, it is, is it augmenting the team? Is it empowering them? Or there is also, because every time a new technology comes in, people get suspicious that it will take away my job as well. So how do you look at the role it is going to play within teams and organizations? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think that that's this is you know this goes into the philosophical of where AI sits and where we're at in this kind of AI wave. Um, I, I um, you know we've had these discussions internally that you know I, I don't think AI will take your job, but a, uh, but someone that uses AI's full potential will take your job. And so this is uh, a, a tool, you know, really starts with insights, right? So it's AI for insights. Um, it lets you learn faster more efficiently, um, understand what's going on with your clusters in a, in a more efficient, much more efficient way um, than just going and searching through logs in the same way that Lens does that for a developer, right? So um, instead of you know having to run commands and go search, find logs and go sift through them, you can quickly identify where these logs are coming from, uh, point to you know specific pods, clusters, what have you, um, and navigate between them. Uh, in the same way, Lens Prism allows for faster insights uh, right now, um, as far as it, you know, what it can do in the future, that's going to be up to the developers and how they want to use it. Right. Can you also talk about what else is new in this release? So one other thing that came out in this, uh, this release with, with lens, uh, is that we've, we've also created a new connection mechanism to AWS. 
so EKS clusters, um, you know, as as we've seen, there's a lot of complexity. And again, back to our value proposition of simplifying um, the complex, um, the the traditional method is, you know, going and getting cube config file. Uh, a lot of times that requires some some effort from the developer, right? Um, and so what we've done is uh, created a connection with AWS, allowing users to go in and sign in, single sign on, uh, and whatever is in their profile. So any number of clusters that are in their profile are automatically in input into Lens. Um, so while it's you know just a, a technical kind of connection, uh, we expect that to also grow uh, in our ability to connect to other things inside of AWS infrastructure, for example. Um, and we also expect to, to expand this to other cloud providers. Um, but the nice thing about it is so as a cluster is removed from your um, your profile in AWS, for example, uh, due to permissions, what have you, some tech policy change in departments, any of that, um, the cluster is also removed from visibility inside of Lens. And so it's it stays up to date. Um, and as clusters are added, they are into your AWS profile. They're also added into, uh, into Lens. And so with that, you have up-to-date cluster information, have a simplified you know connection time and then you have this ai assistant on top of this that connects and can go in and find out all the information uh, for you about what's going on and what's happening uh, to find greater efficiencies in your in your infrastructure uh, let's talk about the teams who want to get started who want to try prism uh, how how can they access it is it part of lens is it something separate is it different tier is it a trial version how can they get started with lens prism so Lens Prism is, uh, while we talk about it as a standalone product, because we do think it will, um, it does change the way users will interact with not just Lens, but with Kubernetes clusters in general. Um, it is just part of Lens. So right now it is part of Lens. Uh, it is included in the uh, Pro Plus or Enterprise subscriptions. Uh, so if you're, um, if you have access to and you already have a license for Lens in uh, one of those mechanisms, you'll have access to Lens Prism and the AWS connection, along with some other features that make um, navigating your clusters uh, a little bit easier. Um, if you'd like to get started today, obviously going to k8slens.dev, uh, downloading and the latest version. Um, we are working on a trial mechanism to allow users to go in and get started quickly uh, with this, see the value. Uh, and if they'd like to purchase, they obviously can. Uh, and again, it's included with the standard lens pricing and there's no been no pricing change um, with, uh, with the ad of, of lens prism or the AWS connection. So we tried to keep this as, as simple as possible. Kyle, thank you so much for joining me today. And of course, give us an update on Lens and uh, Lens Prism. And as you rightly mentioned that the scope may go beyond. And sometimes that's what happens with open source and these technologies. You start to solve one problem and then it just expand beyond you know, what you initially thought. So uh, that also means that you'll talk a lot about Lens and Lens Prism in the future. But I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate it.